Hello, everyone, and welcome to our special Mobile World Congress 17, hashtag MWC17. I'm John Furrier here inside the Cube studio, breaking down all the analysis we're going to be covering Mobile World Congress. We kind of know some news is coming out. That's uh, Monday and Tuesday, all day coverage. Uh, we're here with at RUV Roof, Roof Cohen, entrepreneur I've known for years. Going back to what first met in the cloud days back in 08 timeframe, 09 when, when DevOps was really the beginning of the movement. You have uh, been an entrepreneur, you sold multiple companies, multi-time uh, successful entrepreneur. But you've been deep in the cloud game. Welcome to uh, the Cube special coverage of Mobile World Congress. Well, thanks, thanks for inviting me, I'm happy to be here. Um, the other thing too is we just tried to uh, get the Periscope thing working, so we have our little Periscopes going here, but this is really the media landscape that's going to be one of the themes at Mobile World Congress that certainly will be a front and center. These service providers have to have a business model. Uh, and media entertainment has been on their, their to-do list. Just a lot of the plumbing hasn't gotten done. And the new trend that's going to be really front and center is AI. We were we were joking about that, but seriously, you're doing a lot of you know discussions around AI. And then Intel's 5G announcement, which they pre-announced uh, this week prior to Mobile World Congress with 5G, is their positioning as a step-up game changer. So you got 5G overlay network, uh, you have real plumbing that's getting done with NFE network function virtualization. You have the app market exploding. <laughs> Will the service providers ever, ever make it? Will the telcos actually figure out a business model? Well, you know, they're, they're always the pipes and you, you're always going to need pipes. They, there's an endless amount of opportunities for those people figuring out what to do with those pipes. Um, you know, I, I don't know if it's, it's, this is the question we've been asked for 20 years. Do, do they want to be more than dumb pipes, right? Well, they have to have find a business model. I mean, I think one of the things I was looking at the Intel announcement was, you know, is 5G a technology looking for a problem or does it really actually create a step up function in terms of capability? I mean, 4G is just an evolution of 3G, LTE is getting some speeds there. But I mean, my family hits their caps on, on all the, on the data we're doing. People are hitting their data caps. We need more data. So the question is, is that, going to be ready for prime time. Your thoughts on? Well, there's almost like a Moore's law of data, right? The more data you have available to use, the more things you can do with it. You know, Periscope's a prime example, right? Now now they're doing a whole variety of different video related things. Facebook Lives, you know, there, there's a YouTube Lives. Everyone wants to do live. And all that requires massive amounts of data, especially if you want to do sort of high definition really, you know, related things. We, we were actually trying to set up a Periscope before the, the broadcast this morning. And one of the first things that came apparently was we had to limit our bit rate to 800 kilobits, which is you know relatively small when you think about it. <laughs> yeah, I mean, that's the that's the bandwidth issues. I mean, at the end of the day, it comes down to last miles. We always say, but let's get into some of the some of the analysis of uh, Mobile World Congress and let's get down under the hood. Is cloud uh, truly ready for prime time? When I say cloud, I mean obviously full stack infrastructure because network virtualization has been one of those kind of shifting sands, if you will. NFV is, has been one of those things that's been kind of evolving. OpenStack has seen to be much more of a telco uh, use case in some of the OpenStack summits we've covered. Um, your thoughts on the progress of cloud-ready telcos? You know, it comes down to, if you're going to build an application, whether you're an enterprise, whether you're an individual developer, or, or something in between, you're probably not going to build it in your own data center, whether that's a closet in the back of your office or, or your own, you're probably going to go and build something that's quick and fast and efficient. And that, that really is starting to look like things that are serverless, things that are event driven, and that isn't really sitting in your own data center anymore. So what's your take on the ecosystem? Do you think that the ecosystem play for um, the, the Mobile World Congress is going to shift at all. I mean, I was commenting to Dave Vellante um, just last week and Jeff Frick here on the Cube team that CES, which we don't go to anymore because it's gotten too big, uh, but this year we did cover it you know, here in the studio uh, like we're doing with Mobile World Congress. It just seems that CES is no longer a consumer electronics show. It's more of a car show. Autonomous vehicles are obviously front and center. That's the, that's the glam, that's the eye candy. Mobile World Congress isn't, doesn't seem to be a device show anymore, it's, or it's shifting away. Last year, Mark Zuckerberg gave a keynote speech, and he saw that shift. I mean, it, what's Mobile World Congress turning into, in your opinion? It's, a, it's an app show. So where CES still sort of has this focus on, on the actual physical things that you can touch and, and build, you know, the, the mobile apps of the world are now the things that dominate mo mobility, right? It's, it, is a phone interesting? Uh, not really. <laughs> what you do on your phone is definitely interesting. It's interesting to, to look at also, the, uh, to, and talking to folks about Mobile Mobile World Congress is one of those shows where it's a biz dev show too. A lot of people who fly over to Barcelona um, don't really go for the pure content. There's more 
business deals going on. All the top executives of the big technology companies go there. Um, your thoughts on landscape of the, the the vendors out there that are suppliers to the cons this new consumerized market? You see any deals happening that that you think would be interesting? I mean, where do you see the formation of the industry lining up? Obviously, some things have to get done at a technical level. Five G is great, great hope for that. Um, but some companies are, are trying to transform. Look at Cisco. I mean, these companies like Cisco, companies like Hewlett Packard Enterprise, you know, VMware, uh, AWS, Google, Intel. Qualcomm. Yeah. I mean, there seems to be a feeling of like posturing in, in a reef set, if you will. 2017 so far is shipping up to be the year of Snapchat, if you ask me, with, the, with a pending IPO. They're saying that their revenues are going to be increasing 5x. Um, you know, it, it looks like everything we've been t talking about, you know, the app-based world is, is sort of <laughs> culminating in, in the Snapchat thing. So the question is, is Snapchat going to live up to all the hype and that's surrounding them as the sort of next generation of, you know, the next Facebook, the next Google, the next whatever? What's well, interesting, the Snapchat brings up the conversation of kind of people who have their head in the sand versus people who are kind of riding this wave. Facebook was totally poo-pooed during the IPO. I remember leading up to the IPO, it was like, oh my God, there's no way they can do it. They can never be the next Google. That was kind of the comparison. Google was, was compared to Microsoft, um, and then you know Facebook was compared to Google. And then everyone's like, no freaking way that's going to happen. Why would anyone want to see that company as social net for college kids? Uh, and now some adults are coming on. And then look what happened, right? So the, 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 the world changed. Snapchat's the same way. So you know, it's interesting. It's not what you think the, the core competency shifts and the, cons the user consumption becomes democratized. Mm -hmm. So the question is, what does Snapchat mean for telcos? Does that mean that they're just pipes? Or what do they do? How do they get in front of this? You got Netflix and you got Amazon out there with now the video stuff. People want content. They want it fast. They want it in high quality. And they want it on the go. So the, yeah, it is a question. I think that the, the, the challenge that a lot of these telcos are having is the fact that they still have a bit of a monopoly in many parts of the world and they use that monopoly to you know, inflict quite a bit of pain. So it's, it's uh, you know, I, don't, I don't think that that's something that they're gonna be able to get away with very much longer. So what's your take on AI since you've uh, been doing a lot of AI? I mean, obviously AI's been around in the 80s when I got my CS degree. Lisp was out there, neural networks, object-oriented program was hitting the scene. You know, you had this kind of mindset and it was still AI was this elusive academic, you know, mental model and some coding. Now it's all the rage when you look at autonomous vehicles and you look at IoT, drones, a new landscape is mm -hmm. here, connected consumer. Uh, your thoughts on where AI is, is it, is it right now? I'm certainly it's hyped, we all agree oh, on yeah. that. There's been several you know, iterations of AI over the last 40 years. Every time technology appears, you, you hear you know, about AI. In the 70s, you, you saw things like Space Odyssey, and, and there was this sort of rush to AI-related activities around the first generation of, of computing. Then, then that sort of, we realized that, well, it wasn't really possible, and, and it disappeared for 25 years. And then it reemerged in the early days of internet. Oh, it was still too early. <laughs> so now, 15, 20 years later, again, we, we are in this uh, another dawn of AI. But, there is some critical differences. Now there are tooling that allows you to do the sorts of things that we had only dreamt of before, whether it's natural language processing, you know, generation of, of uh, information, and other various forms of analytics. So all these things are culminating in these opportunities where, that were really never possible until now, including things yeah. like cloud computing. Well, machine learning certainly is the center of that. I love the machine learning rage, but machine learning's been around for a long time as well. I mean, machine learning isn't necessarily new. It's mostly software that has to do with algorithms, but now you have data and compute. I mean, this is the new thing, right? I mean, data's available and you got tons of compute. Yep. It was hard. Yeah. It was really, really hard. And anyone that's actually tried to go out and do a machine learning system, neural net, realized quite quickly that you had to be a PhD to figure out how to use these tools. So now all these tools were, were being put together into platforms and end user applications. So no longer do I have to go and try to put together a, a Lego, you know, rector set of stuff. I can go, I can get mostly everything I need to solve a problem and I can be off to the races quite quickly. So what's your up work you're doing now, Rube? You've been an entrepreneur. Give us the latest update on what's uh, in your world right now. You were uh, obviously instrumental in a lot of cloud ventures and obviously you've been in the industry, uh, certainly as an influencer as well. You get the little blue check on Twitter, which I don't have yet. Twitter rejected me twice. I got to get I got to get to the Twitch. <laughs> Stu has it, Stu Miniman on our team. But uh, it's all seriousness. This is a new world and you're on the front lines, both as a media producer, you've got a great podcast, but also you're, you're in, the, in the industry. 
And where is cloud going and where's that top of the stack action? Because that really is, you mentioned apps, that's where the action is right now. What do you see happening and what's, what are you up to these days? Well, you know, it's a couple areas. One of the things they don't tell you is after you sell your business, you, you get a, you lose a little bit of your purpose. <laughs> First world problem for sure. You make some good cash. Yeah, putting exactly. it in the bank there. Bank yeah. some cash. Yeah. So, you know, after, uh, after Anomaly and Virtue Stream exited, there, there was, you know, this period where, where I get to do kind of the things that I want to do. And, you know, that, you know, investing in, in other startups was, uh, you know, the thing that apparently you do. I, I focused heavily on AI related companies. Um, actually, I just recently did a uh, investment in a company called Zoom.ai, which is really doing some cool stuff around enterprise focused um, AI work. Um, also, I've, I've got a day job as well outside of that. I've, I recently joined a company here in San Jose that focuses on security for containerized environments, so sort of policy-based security, very, very, very low-level stuff. But uh, uh, At the orchestration layer or at the Docker layer or where would you? It's, uh, it's, at, it's even lower than that. It essentially orchestrates and the policy around things like system calls and, and networking itself. So rather than having to focus on the complexities of all the various parts of, of a you know environment, what we do is we basically, basically say, hey, look at the tags that exist in things like Kubernetes. Mm -hmm. And then those tags define the policies and in which things can communicate with one another, let's say it's a layer three network, or what has read or write access to the system calls themselves. What, uh, is that a new company for you? Or is that it's, you guys launched? Yeah, well, we're we're in the process of launching. It's, so it's, stealth. It's stealthy, I'm telling you about it right now. <laughs> so what's the name? Yeah, it's Apparetto. Apparetto, so there it is, we're launching yeah. on the cube here, on Periscope, pre-recorded for our Mobile World Congress special coverage. All right, so this is basically, this is the cloud native goes, goes to full scale cloud for apps. Exactly. So, it, you know, containers, we've come full circle. Can, anyone that's been around for a while knows containers is, is certainly not a new trend. You know, yeah. you know, Solaris 25 years ago doing containers. Um, the implementation of it around microservices and the tooling around DevOps mm -hmm. and Docker and other various, uh, you know, Kubernetes types deployments have made it much more um, readily attainable in terms of using it within an enterprise or, or run the mill application. We were talking with a lot of folks leading up to Mobile World Congress prep for our special coverage and microservices comes up heavily and microservices as an integration layer. And one of the things that we're seeing, I want to get your thoughts on this, is you see IBM just announced this week here in San Francisco at their IBM Connect event. Oh, it's our Lotus, Domino, and Verve, which is their, their, their collaborative software. But the key to all this collaborative software, even to the oracles of the world and, and to Amazon, is integration with third-party apps. And microservices and containers become a critical component of that. So for entrepreneurs and or app developers, a new kind of third-party developers emerging you know, and they need to integrate. What is the role microservices play in all this? This is a really key point, and because this will point right at the telcos, because whoever can embrace an ecosystem of app developers from an integration standpoint, it will be will win, in my opinion. Your thoughts, do you see the same way, and how does microservices and all this stuff play into that? Well, there's, there's two. Is it the glue layer? Or? Yeah, it's the glue. There's, it's, I, Lego is, again, kind of the thing that pops in my mind. There are these two sort of battling you know, schools of thought. One is microservices, which you know, allows you to easily plug and play these various components. The other is serverless. You know, this, this things that are very event driven, you know, they're, they're transient, they allow you to again, act as a kind of you know, glue that puts everything together. One's based on a, you know, predominantly the idea of containers, you know, which is kind of a lightweight OS, and the other is basically saying, I don't need an OS. All I need is the functions that I need when I need them, and I put them together, and I'm off the races. I think that, that most applications aren't ready for a whole you know, choice of just doing one or the other. It's kind of a combination. Mm -hmm. So the, the exciting thing now is you can you know, do what used to take weeks or months in a matter of days with these types of technologies. So your final thought on Mobile World Congress, what do you expect to see in the, in the hype cycle? Noise and where's the signal? Where do you see this, uh, this event happening? What's your thoughts? I, I think we're going to see a, a lot more in, in the focus of things like media and the and convergence. I think video related activities is, is certainly going to remain to be hot. I think the, the, the tooling around enabling that type of you know, high definition video focus is going to be a, a, pri a priority for a lot of these companies. And the tooling around that will, will be a priority. All right, we're here at Roof breaking down the Mobile World Congress uh, uh, analysis and preview and all what's happening in the news, obviously uh, Intel with the 5G, big announcement. I think they opened the curtain, raised the curtain early. Obviously they're competing with Qualcomm, which has a different licensing agreement than Intel, which is, you know, you see Apple as a big customer of Qualcomm and, and Intel. Interesting because, you know, as the price of the hardware goes down, the chip guys want more cash, Qualcomm wants more cash than Intel. 
Very interesting dynamic. I think this ecosystem is going to be uh, something that's going to watch. I think I think there's going to be a battle. I'm predicting that Mobile World Congress will see a, a battle of uh, the ecosystem. You're going to see whoever can make the market and shift the game will be the winner. Roof, thanks for spending the time. Appreciate it. This is Silicon Angle broadcasting here in Palo Alto for Mobile World Congress 17 special coverage. Thanks for watching. Stop.